So speaking of leadership, I have the honor of introducing a special guest speaker, Secretary Javier Becerra. He will just deliver closing remarks for this program, but I will tell you that under his leadership, uh, really have we seen tremendous progress going forward and energy in trying to address the issues we talked about today. Secretary Becerra is the 25th Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, the first Latino to hold office in the history of the United States. As Secretary, he will carry out President Biden's vision to build a healthy America, and his work will focus on ensuring that all Americans have health security and access to health care. You know, throughout his career, the Secretary has made it his priority to ensure that Americans have access to affordable health care, they need to survive and thrive. From his early days as a legal advocate representing individuals with mental illness to his role as Attorney General of the State of California. Secretary Becerra served 12 terms in Congress as a member of U.S. House of Representatives. And during his tenure, he was the first Latino to serve as a member of the powerful committee on Ways and Means. He served as chairman of the party's, his party's caucus as a ranking member of Ways and Means Subcommittee on Social Security and ranking member of the Subcommittee on Health. You know, uh, Secretary Becerra was born in Sacramento, son of a working class parents, who is the first in his family to receive a four-year degree, earning his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Stanford University. He earned his JD from Stanford Law School. His mother was born in Jalisco, Mexico, and immigrated to the United States after marrying his father, a day laborer turned construction worker. Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for talking to us. You know, throughout the day's meeting, we've discussed the compounding health crisis of pandemics, climate change, and equity, focusing on crossing the policy and equity chasm. HHS plays a really key role as a key government agency to address these challenges. I hope you will focus your remarks today on your vision and the plan for tackling this issue. So everyone, please join me for welcoming Secretary Becerra. Dr. Zhao, thank you very much for the very generous introduction. And also thank you for your leadership at the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, I wanna thank each and every one of you who has made this country so relied on around the world when it comes to medicine and science, a place that you can count on, that you can trust, so very important. And if it were not for our, our scientists and our professionals in healthcare who come together, especially through the National Academy of Medicine, I don't think we'd be as accomplished. So thank you for what you do and for inviting me to say a few words. And you sure know how to score some points. Uh, uh, electing Dr. Walensky, our CDC director, and Dr. Murthy, our Surgeon General, uh, yes. to serve on the NAM. <laughs> uh, you, you, you know how to make a good <laughs> intro into my remarks today, so I appreciate that very much. They are so very accomplished. They uh, fit the mold of the, the people that you count on at NAM, and NAM will benefit dramatically by having them now serve as elected members and so well, we're you, thrilled to, you, to know you, that. You have great taste and you're pointing to great people. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Amen. So I, I want to get into some of the vision and the goals that we have, but I must start by saying that we meet today at what I consider an inflection point in our history. And whether it's talking about climate change or whether it's talking about the, the subject of your the pandemic, COVID-19, uh, it's it is a point in time where people will look back and see what we did and where we went. But more importantly, for this particular discussion, I want to say that at this particular time, at least I believe, science itself is under attack. During the COVID-19 pandemic, during the entire debate on climate change, I think you all see what I'm saying, but take the pandemic. Americans have been exposed to a wide range of misinformation about masks, about social distancing, about treatments, and about vaccines. 
We know that the misinformation has led those who are misinformed to be less likely to get vaccinated and more likely to risk contracting COVID-19. According to a recent poll, nearly half of people who say they don't trust the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also say they're not likely to get vaccinated. A majority of unvaccinated adults actually believe the vaccine poses a bigger risk to them and their health than not getting vaccinated. In another poll, it showed that 95% of Americans believe misinformation is a real problem in this country, 95%. And yet in that same poll, only 20% of Americans believe that they're spreading misinformation. By May of this year, two of every three unvaccinated adults had heard at least one COVID vaccine myth, and they either believed it or wondered if it were true. And an analysis of millions of social media posts found that false news stories were 70% more likely to be shared than true stories. Another study showed that even brief exposure to misinformation made people less likely to want to get a COVID vaccine. This is about more than numbers though. There are real grieving families behind these devastating statistics. After one man, an otherwise healthy 45 year old father from Washington state died of COVID-19, his children said, we believe he was a victim of misinformation. This is a gentleman who would watch YouTube videos of conspiracy theories, people making millions of dollars off of spouting lies that ultimately may have impacted this man's death. One thing is clear, lies can kill, falsehoods carry consequences. This has been a long time in the making. I'm sure I don't have to remind any of you of the so-called death panel mania that overtook discussions of the Affordable Care Act. I was in Congress at the time, and at one point, nearly half of Americans said they believed the government would decide when to stop care for seniors. So I ask you, in the decade plus since the ACA was passed, how many death panels have dictated your family's elder care? But it's out there, and it's not just health care. Climate change has been infected by this for years. And think about disaster preparedness. In California, where we've seen communities burn to the ground from wildfires, some have advocated ideas like raking the forest floors, even though experts say that that misunderstands the science of wildfires. Or how about the idea of nuking hurricanes, which sounds like a bad science fiction movie to begin with. Misinformation was also rampant during the 2014 Ebola breakout. And persistent rumors continue even today about AIDS, HIV. And for decades, that has undermined our efforts to reduce the infection rate of AIDS, HIV in this, in this country. If you separate fact from fear or fact from fiction or fact from alternative fact, then the truth becomes pretty clear. Science can defend itself in a world of reason and evidence. But that's not always the world we live in today. Now, of course, health misinformation is not new to the U.S. We have a long history of fighting quackery, even at the highest levels of government. When Joseph Lister presented his theories in the late 1800s on antisepsis at the World's Fair, Doctors even laughed at him. When President James Garfield was shot, those who were actually caring for him gave him an infection that was probably worse than the actual bullet wound he suffered because they didn't believe in germs. Abraham Lincoln, he suffered from mercury poisoning after taking what was called in those days the blue pill. Like countless others at the time, he was led to believe in junk science. The difference, of course, is these examples are from a century and a half ago. Now we know a lot more, and yet we still have quacks pushing lies. But, what's, but what we're seeing today isn't just an attack on science. Dr. Zhao, and to each and every one of you, I submit to you that this is an attack on scientists, on the very people who dedicate their lives to the facts and truth, who study, who practice, who hypothesize, 
and test to get a better understanding of the way our worlds work or should work. This isn't the first time scientists themselves have been under the proverbial microscope. We're all familiar with the trials and tribulations of Galileo or Darwin or Newton and others. But in many ways, today's assault on scientists is different from those of yesteryear, when it was harder to prove that the Earth was round or that gravity was real or that planets revolved around the sun, that humans evolved from primates. Today's lies are tweeted and retweeted by the millions, posted and shared by friends and family, liked and subscribed to or by anyone with a Wi-Fi connection. They've been photoshopped and deepfaked to look and hook their audience. They appeal to emotion, not reason, to the amygdala, not the cerebrum. They prey on fear and anxiety, and they erode people's trust in the very reality before their eyes that people are dying every single day from this virus, even when we have safe and effective vaccines to stop it, that our earth, our planet, Mother Earth, is crumbling before us and crying out to us to help save her as we continue to pollute her. They say a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets its shoes on. Well, the lies are piling up. The reactions are getting serious, troubling, and even violent. And the truth is still stuck tying its shoelaces. In this moment, our leaders, the public servants in office, and the women and men of science and medicine must decide. Science or lies? Medicine or myth? Fact or fiction? Fight or flight? I choose fight. I want HHS to be a fighter. And at HHS, we're working with our partners to spread the word about the importance of vaccination in school aged children and teachers. We have a public education campaign underway that involves lifting up the voices of some 14,000 trusted messengers in our communities throughout the country to remind everyone vaccines are safe and effective. Under our action plans, we're in the process of requiring our entire federal staff to be fully vaccinated. We're also re requiring that nearly 300,000 educators at Head Start programs be vaccinated as well. We've invested billions to scale up screening in schools and underserved populations and to expand mental health, telehealth services for pediatric care because we know this pandemic has had devastating consequences on our kids' mental health. We're also following through on President Biden's commitment to tackle our nation's climate crisis and building on the work that I started when I was an attorney general in California to advance environmental justice. That's why in August, I was very proud to announce that HHS has established the Office of Climate Change and Health Equity. This is the first office of its kind at the national level to address climate change and health equity. And I think you know as well as anyone and perhaps better than most, what it means to combine science with the reality of especially our disadvantaged communities on the ground today, to work with them today to keep them from being the first and worst hit by climate change, as is always the case for disenfranchised communities. It is why we are here. It is why we want to apply our study, our rigor, our testing, so we can make progress on these things. That is what leadership grounded in fact and science looks like. Now, this is just a snapshot of our efforts. And as secretary, I haven't been uh, content to simply view this work from our Humphrey Building in Washington, D.C. Over the past year, I've had a chance to travel to engage communities directly. I've met with parents and teens in Georgia. I've visited with tribal leaders in Seattle, farm workers in the Central Valley of California. I met with faith leaders in Oklahoma, families in Dallas, healthcare workers in hospitals in New Orleans, and with surge response teams in Las Vegas, Nevada. I've seen firsthand the dedication of our frontline workers, the compassion of our medical professionals, and the resilience of our people. They're counting on us to fight this misinformation head on. They're counting on us to fight lies and save lives. Dr. Zhao, to you and everyone at the National Academy of Science and excuse me, the National Academy of Medicine, I say to you that when we combine science with our fervent hope for a better future, we're gonna not just save lives, 
we're going to add prosperity to those in the future. And so I hope you will continue to join with those who want to fight lies and put the truth out there. Together, we can make sure science wins the day. I am thrilled that you invited me to be here. I hope that we will find uh, that we are able to partner with you in the future because our work is too important to not come together. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Secretary Becerra. We are tremendously honored uh, that you joined us today to provide remarks to conclude our scientific program. And uh, let me uh, ask you all to join me in thanking the Secretary. Thank you. So we're going to be turning to the final session of the annual meeting now. And um, I just want to, uh, before we, we move to the President's Forum, uh, really thank everybody. It takes a village to put this kind of program together. And we just had a remarkable team. I want to thank the staff um, at, at the National Academy. I think we've heard um, that, you know, we have a lot of challenges, but I hope uh, that on the plus side, we also heard the engagement of the scientific enterprise um, in learning more, um, uh, in enhancing what we know, uh, but doing it in a way that gets us from what we know to what we do um, in an equitable and effective way.